Uh, hi, everyone. Hey, everyone. Um, my just name's... letting. Oh, oh, sorry, Stacey. I was just letting you know that I'm here. I was having a oh, tech excellent. issue. <laughs> oh, no problem. No problem. Thank you. Um, so, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Stacey Penham with uh, QSR International, and we're really excited about this uh, webinar today. Um, yeah, it's youth-led anti-racism racism research, and I'll be introducing the speakers to you in a second. Uh, just to let you know how uh, the webinars work in GoToWebinar, uh, so if there's an orange box with a white arrow. If you click on the white arrow, it'll open up the menu. At any time, feel free to uh, type in a question in the question area or in the chat area. Uh, we're going to take questions at the end, but it's fine to do it as we go. Um, there's also a handout, so I've uploaded the PowerPoint slides you'll be seeing today in the hand handout section, so feel free to download those. Uh, this is being recorded, so you'll get the recording uh, sometime next week uh, also. Um, so with that, I will get started. So first off, um, my name is Stacy Penna. I'm the community director here at QSR International, and um, I'm excited to be partnering with Ali from Sage Publications. Hi everyone, I'm Ali Owen, and I'm the commissioning editor for Sage's Research Methods books. I'm based out of our London office, so I work globally on anything social science methods, and I am very grateful to be here today with Stacy, Adriana, and Katie. Thank you, Ali. And our presenters today, um, Adriana Aldana, and she's an assistant professor at California State University, Dominguez Hills, in the Department of Social Work. She is a community-based practitioner and developmental psychologist with an emphasis on youth sociopolitical empowerment. And presenting with her is Katie Richards um, Schuster, and she's an associate professor at the University of Michigan School of Social Work. Her research focuses on understanding the strategies and approaches, approaches for engaging young people and communities. So welcome, Adriana and Katie. Thank you so much for having us and organizing this webinar. Katie and I are humbled, to say the least, to have this opportunity to share our work around youth-led anti-racism research. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen make sure that that's working for you all on my end it says that it's showing is it showing for you all it's no? showing white yeah let me try that again mm -hmm. yeah we had these issues last time let me try it again there yes. we go got it excellent <laughs> perfect <laughs> all right well thanks again and welcome everyone who is joining us on this Friday. And um, again, as I was saying, Katie and I are really humbled to have this opportunity to share some of our work. We want to begin first um, taking a moment to really honor and also mourn the lives that were taken from us this week by the terrorist attacks in Georgia that were fueled by white supremacy and misogyny. I think for those of us who study racism, or who live in the United States as people of color or racialized groups, this news isn't new, but it is always really distressing. So I hope that those of you who are sitting with a heavy heart have the opportunity to process with loved ones and take care of yourself. We also want to take a moment before we begin to acknowledge um, and express our gratitude to indigenous people from more than 575 tribes and pueblos who were the first peoples of these lands and stewards of the um, what we call the Americas. We would also like to recognize the laborers who built our institutions, often exploited, underpaid, or enslaved. Let us acknowledge that we continue to benefit from this land and this labor. Let us strive to do work that honors this privilege by working towards liberation for all. And for us, you know, our work is really motivated by creating social change. And we're hoping that our webinar today will give you a sense of why we need youth-led anti-racism research, introduce um, why PAR, and it's a very brief introduction and how it links to critical race theory, 
We'll review some of our commitments to this work and what that looks like in practice by giving you some case examples. And that's really where we're gonna spend most of our time, kind of walking through some of the examples of the work that we've done with young people. And then we'll conclude with some just general lessons learned and some guiding questions um, for your future work and the questions that are really guiding some of our own uh, future projects. As Stacy mentioned, feel free to post your questions in the chat box as we go, and then we'll answer as many as we can during the Q&A. So getting into the why we need youth-led anti-racism research. I mean, we're seeing more and more um, incidents of white supremacy violence in the news, and there's also in the past year been paid more attention to being strategic about addressing institutional and structural racism. And I think that that is very important for us to really underscore and highlight the importance of that work, but also to be mindful of the very subtle and covert ways in which white supremacy is embedded within our institutions, often in ways that we don't even notice. And for us, that really speaks to what Sean Jin Wright asked of social researchers when it comes to studying young people. He asks, in what ways does our work move beyond simplistic explanations, descriptions, and predictions of youth behavior? Now, at the surface, this question does not pose any kind of um, blatant uh, attention to racism, but we find that in social science research, specifically basic research, White supremacy culture is embedded in it in many different ways, the way that it is embedded in other institutions. Jones and Okun highlight characteristics of white supremacy in agencies and organizations in their Dismantling Racism workbook. And we're gonna highlight a few of those as it relates to social science research today. For example, in academia and in scholarship, we focus and worship the written word through publications, through research methods that focus on writing and documenting accounts of human behavior. We also find that sometimes the way that we're trained in our academic institutions really limit our ways of thinking about research, that there's only one right way to accomplish um, a sound and rigorous research study. We also have to be mindful that um, as scholars, as researchers who have the power to define who the youth are, what the problems they are facing, and the behaviors that we're interested in um, studying has a lot of weight and power in socially constructing young people and especially socially constructing youth of color through a deficit model. And so this um, notion of paternalism, right, that those in power believe that they have um, more sound ways of making decisions for people who are marginalized is something we need to really complicate in our research process. And we also see that in academic research, we often center and emphasize a positivistic approach to research that requires a scholar or researcher to be objective, um, where we find that in the research that Katie and I do with young people, um, our subjective and situated ways of knowing are essential. And so what we find is that when we're centering young people in the research process, we need to decenter some of these characteristics of white supremacy throughout the research process. So what can we do, right? How can we decenter white supremacy culture in social science research? For us, for Katie and I, the answer, the simple, not so simple answer is to engage youth, right? To engage youth throughout the process. So quick note, um, today won't be a step-by-step -step guide for doing YPAR, just in, because we don't have the time for that, but also remembering that there is no right way to accomplish this work. So we're sharing the experiences and the ways that we've approached this work, but there's also a wealth of growing literature around YPAR taking multiple and different perspectives that are just as valuable to engaging in anti-racism scholarship. So quickly going through what um, YPAR is and how it connects to critical race theory. 
YPAR is intergenerational and collective partnerships and processes of investigating the social conditions that are affecting young people. And for us, that means engaging high school aged youth in documenting their communities, documenting their schools, um, and discussing and analyzing their lived experiences as it relates to race relations in their communities, racism, or um, experiences of racial inequality. YPAR is not a research method. It is a radical epistemological challenge to um, the creation of knowledge, right? It tells us and encourages us to shift power over the people that we are studying and researching to power with the participants, to engaging them as um, stakeholders in the research process and the dissemination of those findings. We see youth as capable of addressing the social factors that oppress them. And when we're thinking about racism, that means centering the lived experiences of youth of color, but also engaging white youth as allies in this work. YPAR is not anti-racism praxis on its own. I think that's important for us to state up front that just because we're engaging in youth participatory action research doesn't mean that we're engaging in anti-racism praxis, that we have to be really intentional about integrating frameworks that helps us center an analysis of racism and being mindful of intergroup dynamics and power differences. And so for us, um, we find that critical race theory really lends itself to a lot of our projects because our projects are often engaging youth from very different backgrounds socioeconomically, from different regional areas, as well as racial ethnic um, uh, differences. Now, both YPAR and CRT engage in critical praxis. They come from critical theoretical perspectives. Um, YPAR also includes um, transformative pedagogies that have informed it. Critical race studies for, um, and theory, for those of you who might be new to it, emerged in the late 1970s, early 80s from legal scholars who were critiquing the quote unquote colorblind approach to the law and saying, we don't live in an equitable society where justice is blind, that in fact our um, institutions and the US was grounded on white supremacy, on institutional and structural racism that affected black, indigenous and other people of color. Both of these, as I kind of alluded to earlier, critique a positivistic approach to research that um, assumes objective uh, data collection and analysis. YPAR really speaks to centering the local knowledge of young people, while CRT really emphasizes these multiple ways of knowing that are grounded in the experiences of people of color. And so both of these are rejecting kind of deficit approaches to seeing participants um, as agentic or as um, for young people specifically at risk, right? When we think about a lot of the research that's done with youth of color, um, we're often framing them as being at risk or in need of services or assistance. Similarly, CRT suggests that people of color, people who have been racially mar marginalized or marginalized by other forms of oppression, um, hold unique insights into these systems that are affecting them. And so therefore they're holding knowledge and also are able to create knowledge. So core aims of both of these is really to use research as an avenue for creating social change. And in YPAR, we're leveraging young people's um, participation. And with CRT, again, we're using this idea that youth of color in particular can have these counter narratives that help us disrupt racism. I mentioned earlier, we won't be able to talk um, in depth about youth participatory action research today because we want to get into our examples. And so this is not going to be an exhaustive review of YPAR methods or even pedagogical approaches. So I would encourage you to check out these systemic reviews by Añon and Caraballo and their colleagues. Uh, they are in our reference list, which you'll have access to. And we really hope that you continue to learn more um, about YPAR if this is new to you. 
So I'm going to um, invite Katie to come in and start sharing a little bit about the way we framed more recently our work around anti-racism scholarship with young people and the commitments really that have informed and shaped and motivated our work in this area. Thanks, Adriana. Um, and, um, and I just would reiterate um, that there are a ton of resources in the back for people who want to go more in depth. And of course, you'll also have our contact information if, if we can be helpful. But, um, but we really are thrilled to be able to share a little bit about some of the work that we've been, uh, we've been doing. And the examples that we're going to be sharing from today grow from um, 15 years of collective experience um, in our work and in our Oops. Sorry. <laughs> We're doing this on multiple posts. So um, uh, our 15 years of collective experience working um, on multiple projects. Most of the projects that we're going to talk about today stem from our work in the Metro Detroit area. Um, and it was work that we did together um, when we were both at the University of Michigan, but we've continued to be partners in, in this work and, and the extensions of this work um, since then. And, while each of these projects are, they're interconnected projects, so I'm going to say a word about that, um, but they also are interconnected because they kind of um, stem and relate to, to one another in, in, in different ways. Um, we're going to talk a little bit, of, I'm going to mention a, a brief bit about them, and then, of course, as we unfold the, how we kind of think about the commitments and, and the ways that they show up in our work, um, we'll talk more in depth about these examples. But just to give you a little bit um, of context for the projects that we're going to speak to. Um, so um, the, the first and kind of the, the home bubble, I suppose, of, of all of these work is, um, is the Summer Youth Dialogues Project. And this is an ongoing, it's probably a 15 year um, plus project um, at the University of Michigan that involves intergroup dialogues and involves young people using intergroup dialogue techniques to talk about um, race across city and suburb. Um, um, in the Metro Detroit region. Uh, some of you may know that Detroit is one of the most uh, segregated metropolitan areas in the United States. And so this project has been one attempt to begin to really think about centering issues of race, racism, and segregation and involving young people in engaging with one another and dialoguing with one another um, as, as a vehicle for understanding issues and identifying issues that they can work on um, to create change. And so we've built in evaluation and participatory processes into that, um, into that project that we'll speak a little bit about. But as an outgrowth, every, every year there are young people who um, participate and they are engaged and excited and they, um, and they don't, they don't want to leave the work. They want to continue to the work continue the work. And so after the first summer of having a team of young people say, we want to keep this work going, um, we built the Metro Youth Policy Fellows team. Um, and that became a group of young people, again, across city and suburb, um, across racial and ethnic um, backgrounds who worked together around policy issues um, that were that grew out of um, racism in our metropolitan area. And so there are different kinds of projects, but many of them involve participatory research and youth-led um, research activities in as pieces of their policy and action work. And so we're gonna uh, share a little bit about one of those projects um, called Down Woodward, um, that was a photo voice project um, that had different kinds of policy outcomes, um, as well as the Tri-City Project. And so this was, um, involving some of those young people who are powdered down Woodward, who then came together in a regional coalition with young people from Chicago and from St. Louis to look across um, the three metropolitan areas and come up with policy um, solutions as well. So we're excited to share a little bit about these um, projects. Of course, we could spend the entire hour just talking about one of them, but um, but we'll have other resources if, you, if you'd like to, to learn more about any of them. Okay, so in thinking about commitments, so Adriana talked about kind of core commitments that we hold. And so we're gonna, we're gonna speak to, to four of these today and, um, and how we can bring these lenses um, into, into our work. And so um, we are deeply committed to, to thinking about multiple ways of knowing. We're gonna go through each one of these. So I'll just um, share, um, uh, uh, just highlight them for, for the purposes of this slide. Um, multiple ways of knowing 
um, countering paternalism in our work, both paternalism from youth, from adults to young people, but also amongst um, and within young people themselves. Um, having a deep focus on structural racism uh, and also on activist scholarship. And of course, these are all interconnected concepts, but we're gonna be um, speaking um, to each one and showing, sharing a little bit about the ways in which we think about them as they show up with our work. So the first one is multiple ways of knowing. And so um, when we bring this lens, it, it, it is both about centering youth experience and creative experience, but it really starts from the premise that there are many ways, no one right way um, to do research. And this was something that Adriana um, spoke to um, in uh, a few slides ago, but it really is about thinking about how do we center young people's experiences and voices, um, their own lived experiences as the root of the kind of research work that we do and how it shapes the questions, how it shapes the, the, um, the approach, the methods, um, how it plays out in the analysis, then of course, um, how that translates to action. Um, this having a, having multiple ways of knowing is really um, getting us away from an either or and rather thinking about a both and and so in some of our work um, including the summer youth dialogues work there were multiple forms of evaluation so we saw it as a both and it wasn't um, that we couldn't do um, you know a, a more traditional type of evaluation um, and instead of a youth-led evaluation, but rather thinking about how we could do both of those simultaneously, and they both added to rich understandings of knowledge. Um, it also, um, multiple ways of knowing also allows us to think about multiple approaches. And so Adriana talked about the idea of not worshiping the written word. Um, and so when we think about bringing multiple ways of knowing, it honors creative expression, it honors art, using art, using performing art, using um, different kinds of creative ideas that young people come up with um, that enable us to know things and, and um, engage in, in um, rich, rich, uh, research in, in more rich ways um, than we would have if we only used kind of traditional approaches. So in our own work, where that showed up, we wanted to share an example of the use of cartoons. Um, and what's interesting about this um, is that this was um, created a little bit of challenge for us. So we also wanted to use this webinar to not say that this work is, is always um, easy to do or is always um, simple and not complex. Of course, anytime we're engaging in, in um, processes that are challenging, um, the norm, um, and we're trying to use research as a, as a tool to disrupt the norm, it, it can create tensions. And so we wanted to, in this example, we wanted to share a little bit of that. Um, the youth, so as I mentioned, Summer Youth Dialogues is a summer program that's been going on. And every year we have a team of young people who help lead out an evaluation. And in that process, we ask young people to think about what do they wanna know about the summer, um, what would be the kinds of questions they would be interested in asking, and then of course thinking through kind of how we might, how they might get that information, and then how they might understand it. And every year, the, the youth are really interested in thinking about kind of what did young people know before, and what did they want to know after. So this kind of traditional pre-post um, type approach. But in one particular summer, the young people talked about the idea of using cartoons, and as a way to think about capturing this pre-post knowledge as opposed to kind of a traditional kind of survey. And I think both of us were like, cartoons, how's that gonna work out? And, um, you know, we're a little skeptical about how the approach would, um, would play out. And the young people were very confident that they thought that this would be a great way to um, have people express themselves. They thought, well, sometimes it's easier for us to, to draw our ideas than it is for us to have to kind of speak it or do a do kind of surveys and won't won't um, we won't be able to kind of get the the depth of our of our learning and so you know we kind of thought well we weren't sure how it was going to work out but um, but we had to pause I mean this is a part when we think about what does it mean this is kind of the next commitment that we have around countering paternalism but I had to, we had to stop and say, you know what, why am I saying that cartoons wouldn't be a good idea just because I haven't used them before, I haven't seen it before? That doesn't mean it's not a 
not a great idea. This could be an incredible opportunity. Um, and let's see how it goes. And it was something that the young people really had strong um, perspective on and had strong ideas about. And, um, and so it offered an opportunity for us to um, to try it. And you know what? It was incredible. And we got some really powerful drawings that I don't think we would have necessarily gotten um, if the young people hadn't, hadn't been able to kind of capture that um, through their own art expression as opposed to their own word. So it's just kind of an example of, of, um, of, of, of another way of knowing. Um, in terms of um, countering paternalism, and I'll just say a word about this and then, and then pass it um, to Adriana to talk about an example um, of this from, the, um, from some of our Don Woodward work. Um, but when we think about countering paternalism, so I just gave an example of where it really was about thinking about who we are as an adult and checking our own perspective, checking our own experience, being able to ensure that we really are opening up to, to multiple ways of knowing, to multiple um, new ideas and to centering the voices and experiences of young people. So it is about um, paternalism in terms of re thinking critically about what does it mean to be an adult ally um, and how do we understand our own positionalities as adults and as researchers and, um, and being able to reflect on that process. It also means being, um, it does not mean though that, that we kind of just let young people do their own thing. I mean, we think both of us have, have thought really critically and, um, and some of these references kind of speak to, to this a little bit more, but we talk about our work as adults more as almost like a dance and that it's about scaffolding and supporting young people, helping them envision possibilities, um, helping them, helping build their skills and their confidence to be able to, to, to do what it is they want to do, um, but then also pushing them a little bit to helping them to see new possibilities. And then of course, as they step forward and have an idea like the cartoon, also being able to get out of their way <laughs> or, how, or having them push us back, um, which of course requires a lot of trust and, and relationships building as well. But countering paternalism also means um, thinking about it within the group. And so we are very conscious about process within our work and bringing young people together and really thinking about what does it mean for them to do um, to do their work in a way that, um, that recognizes power um, as it's playing out in real time. So I'm going to turn it to Adriana to talk about an example of this. Thank you, Katie. Yes, and a lot of our work I think because we're engaging youth from varied regional areas, socioeconomic and racial ethnic differences, we have to be really mindful of the group dynamics, even among youth, in addition to our role as adults. And so for us, it's been really helpful to see the research space as what Elena Torres calls um, the contact zone, right? These politically charged spaces where people who have different relationships to social power and social cultural wealth um, in that space and making sure that we are engaging young people in an inclusive and equitable way as much as possible. Um, so for us, what that's meant is that our pedagogy, what we're, we've been calling intergroup empowerment, has integrated intergroup dialogue methods as well as empowerment oriented work, uh, specifically social work with groups, right? And so for us as both um, social workers and um, scholars, Katie is a sociologist by training. I'm a developmental psychologist. I think that's been really helpful as well in our collaborations. One of the key ways that at least I have facilitated um, groups and that we've thought about this is this idea of multi-partiality. Often when we think about conflict resolution, for example, you might think of an impartial moderator, a moderator that's not taking sides and is there to facilitate a conversation. With intergroup dialogues and empowerment work, the person facilitating, in this case, us as adult allies, is not trying to be impartial is instead very acutely aware that there's power differences and imbalances based on our social identities and that we have to be able to interrupt or disrupt when dominant ways of interacting are taking place. So for example, um, 
And this often led to like a side dialogue with our participants about A, what's happening? Do, do you notice it? We're noticing it. Why do you think this is? So an example about that might be, you know, oftentimes our youth that were coming from the suburbs, that might include white youth, um, East Asian youth, for example. And then we have inner city youth who are Muslim, Black, um, Latinx. We often saw that our suburban youth through their schooling experiences just felt more comfortable speaking up earlier in the small group setting and speaking more often. And so we have to help them see that and say, well, we wanna hear from everyone. So it's not just about pausing and inviting youth who might be quiet and helping them see, are you quiet because you are shy or have you been silenced before and don't feel comfortable sharing? And so how can we open up this space so that we're all sharing equitably? Um, similarly, if we see gender dynamics, we need to talk about that. And it, again, it's not to say we wanna shut down the leadership of an individual youth, but say, we are seeing patterns that we see out in the world that are privileging white youth or privileging uh, males in this space. How can we disrupt that? And so I think, again, intergroup dialogue pedagogy, empowerment approaches, and especially multipartiality has been really helpful with that. I also want to um, kind of speak to our focus on structural and cultural racism with young people, often our work is saying, what are the conditions, what are the systems or the institutional practices that are affecting your life? And what does that look like for you? And I think that that's a slightly different approach to looking at racism than a lot of the work that we see, especially I will say in like youth development scholarship that often focuses on individual behaviors or forms of prejudice. So with our work, and it aligns with anti-racist research methods to say, yes, uh, racism includes interpersonal forms of discrimination, but it is embedded within this structural and institutional um, systemic racial oppression. And so for us, that means helping young people and for those of you who might be social political development scholars creating um, opportunities, right, these structural opportunities for, for young people to document, again, what's happening in their communities, what's happening in their schools, what are the patterns of racial inequity that they see and that they have lived, so centering those lived experiences, going back to what I was just mentioning about multipartiality, often that meant that some young people, if they hadn't experienced interpersonal forms of racism, so let's say a white youth saying, well, I don't see race being a factor in my life, we would say, well, why do you don't see race as a factor? What in your environment has made it so that you don't notice racism or that you haven't experienced hardships in the ways that other youth in this space have, right? And so it's interrogating that racial privilege, not allowing people to kind of opt out. So I think by us being able to focus on the structural and institutional forms of racism, it's easier for all young people to be able to kind of see where they're situated in relation to that. And so an example of that is the Downward Work Project. And as Katie mentioned, it was a photo voice project, a year long project that started with the youth documenting their schools first. So they took pictures of their schools and we had conversations and dialogues about what were some differences across schools within the inner city and then in the suburbs. And that really led to wanting to see kind of what does segregation look like in the metropolitan region in Detroit. And so what we did was a, a day long tour. We were on a bus with all of our young people. They were taking pictures as we were driving. Um, we started in the city center. We drove downward, which is um, one of those big byways central to kind of a lot of historical moments in Detroit as well. And we had young people take pictures along the way of like, what do you see in terms of businesses? Who are the residents? What kind of organizations or resources are available? Are there green spaces for people to congregate in? And what do those look like? So we were taking pictures uh, along the way throughout the day. In addition to that, young people were also completing what are called windshield surveys. So it's essentially a checklist again of like, are there grocery stores? Do you see schools? Um, you know, 
what do the buildings and the homes look like? So they were kind of taking those. And we also did pit stops in either schools or community organizations where the young people a, had an opportunity to kind of stretch their legs and take a break, but also do interviews with local community members who gave them additional context. And these were usually um, unstructured interviews that the young people would just ask questions of the community members and, and kind of take notes on those. And so those were the basis of the data for the downward work project. And for us, the analysis was a group process uh, with us facilitating the conversation with the young people to help them make connections between their personal lived experiences, which we had been talking for um, about for months and how it related to the data they had collected. And what we find from that work is that that collective dialogue that was involved in the analysis of structural racism and specifically segregation in Metro Detroit help young people, again, move from that kind of understanding of their own lived experience to this collective critical awareness of patterns of inequality and privilege in the region. Um, and just to kind of connect back to critical race theory, a, a fairly recent article by Gosling frames the use of CRT and photo voice as counter storytelling praxis. And, and that really relates to the tenet of the voices of color or counter narrative use, again, to challenge um, racism. Katie, do you want to take this one? Yeah, great. And so I think when we um, thinking about the um, Down Woodward project and just bringing this anti-racist um, methodology um, and framework um, to bear is, is that knowledge isn't just um, gathered for the sake of knowledge, but it is about what are you going to do with what you learn and how can you use information and use this knowledge to drive change? Um, so for the example of Down Woodward um, that Adriana mentioned, um, and we'll share a little bit about this, um, that they took that information, they did a they did an art exhibit. So the picture that you saw on the last slide was um, was an art exhibit um, and that brought community members. There was a, um, a box, that little box that you can see in the picture was an opportunity for people to um, invite um, responses and thoughts and reflections that people had after watching it. The young people took that information um, and uh, they went to DC actually and were able to take, they developed um, their own analysis and their own recommendations, and they had opportunities to share that with different policymakers, um, their local representatives, as well as, um, as, well as national, national folks. And so being able to think about um, this idea that information, again, isn't just for the sake of gathering information, but is really deeply tied to action outcomes, both action within themselves, so their own socio-political development and their own awareness about how to use information to drive the changes that they want to see and helping to support young people to advocate for those changes um, in their local communities, their critical awareness, um, their own political agency, and again, their own opportunities, but then also their collective, their ability to kind of work collectively to think about changes and the ways that this information gets used to drive programs and policies, the way it gets um, can be used to drive policy advocacy, as I just mentioned, or broader community outreach. So we wanted to share a few examples um, from our own work. Um, some, this kind of first set of, um, set of um, action projects relate more to that kind of traditional civic engagement um, type approach of action where young people use this information to share with local policymakers. Um, so this example in these pictures, um, one year the policy fellows um, took on a multi-year project to do a social justice assessment of the region. Um, they surveyed over a thousand young people. They did focus groups, they collected video reports. Um, they turned this into a report. So the picture um, uh, that you see is the cover of the report that they wrote about young people's voices um, in metropolitan Detroit. And then they used that information to do a number of different things, one of which was to share with the um, Michigan Civil Rights Commission um, to be able to share how young people experienced growing up in the metropolitan Detroit area and what were some of their ideas for change. Um, they've also worked on developing a bill of rights and, um, and done a number of town halls and, and uh, speak outs. And then, of course, I mentioned um, the, the project of going to DC. So this is some of the young people who are involved in the Down Woodward project um, and the work, um, and then with the late John Conyers. 
um, who they presented to. Um, but we also wanted to say that beyond the kind of policy making and kind of civic engagement type work, action work that comes out of some of these research projects and of course community organizing work is also kind of multiple different types of products. And I think that's another piece of it is thinking about the different ways that action can, can look and the different ways that young people's voices and ideas can help shape um, knowledge moving forward. So these young people have done a number of book projects um, where they've, they've written their own narratives um, based on their own experience. And then we've been able to use those, um, they've been able to use those um, as part of their own action, um, including some of them pushing back on their own schools and pushing for more diversity courses and courses on, um, on racism in the metropolitan area. And then they use their book as part of the curriculum. So that's been pretty incredible. They've developed trainings, they've led teacher trainings. Um, and um, and the one, one thing that we wanted to mention is this, um, this bottom bullet point around an action scale. And again, this goes back to the very nature of, um, you know, kind of I think where Adrienne and I started this, that if you give young people opportunities um, to be involved in research, it, it changes um, what we know, how we know, who can know, which of course is at the very basis of, of um, an anti-racist pedagogy is opening up the spaces um, for people to be part of knowledge development. And so one of the teams of youth evaluators of the Summer Youth Dialogues Project um, started seeing patterns of young people talking about the kinds of actions that they were doing as a result of being in the summer youth dialogues, the things that they were doing, the ways that they were checking friends or family members um, around um, jokes or assumptions that they were making or that they were getting involved in um, clubs or that they were going to protests. And so they decided to try to track this. And so they created, they piloted an action scale um, where they took all the ideas that they had seen from the evaluations or the interviews that they had done and the different data points that they had been collecting in the summer. And they created kind of a long list and started piloting that to say, okay, do, how much do young people do before and how much do they do after? And fast forward the scale, which then had been you know, used in, in the various summers adapted a little bit along the way by, by different groups of young people, um, turned into something that Adriana actually helped to, <laughs> to um, do all the um, research and evaluation on to validate um, and it is now um, a validated scale. So I'll let Adriana share a little bit more about that, but it's now being used in dissertation. So the idea that it was a youth created um, tool that really helps to shape and change and is now part of the way social science research is moving forward. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I'll add to that is that, you know, we had been using the action scale internally to um, evaluate the Summer Youth Dialog program, I would say maybe like seven years, seven to eight years. And, and one day I just was like, Katie, this is actually a really good measure. I think we need to move forward and try to validate it so that other people can use it. And I'm really happy that it is out there because and it, it's not to say it's a complete measure of anti-racism action. And because of the time that it was um, created by young people, today I imagine that there's a lot of um, media, ways that, that young people engage in activism through the media and social media specifically that aren't included in it. But I think it, it gives, shows us the promise of engaging young people in ways that it can also inform scholarship and the way that we um, develop measures that are developmentally appropriate for young people. So I'm gonna, uh, no, then you're gonna do the lessons learned, start us off and then I'll uh, wrap up for us. Right, and, and I think just to this um, this point, I mean, I think once we start to, um, we can we can jump in the side, I'm looking at the, the time and realizing um, that I think it's, it's critical from our own work. And I think that the scale is really a great example of something that came from young people that was an, that was an idea that now is about informing um, different forms of, um, of social science research that when we open up the possibility um, and we think about kind of multiple ways of knowing, it changes, it, can, it changes what and how we know things. And I think from our own experience in this work, it's super important 
I feel like a lot of, especially on the on the white power work, it, it focuses back on the outcomes of the young people who participated. And, and while that is very important um, to capture, and of course in our own work, we've seen the power of when young people participate, how it changes who they think they can be, how it changes their own understanding, how it changes their, their critical consciousness, their socio-political development, their agency, their empowerment but it also changes the communities that they're part of. It's changed the programs um, that they've been a part of. It's changed Adriana and, and myself as researchers and as, as people. And so it, I think anti-racist methodology, and when we kind of think about this, it also is important about understanding the ripple effects and the multiple different layers um, of changes um, um, that have happened. Um, and when we are critically reflective of seeing those changes, um, that's an important component of this work. And so one of the things we want to just um, kind of showcase that the commitments, again, as Katie mentioned earlier, are interconnected and will require a multiple um, sets of like knowledge, skills, and practice behaviors. Um, just to highlight some of that again, so being able to establish and maintain trust and open dialogue with youth has been really essential to our work. For us to have a strong understanding of systemic racial inequality at multiple levels, because then we're helping facilitate those conversations with young people. And then also the ability to engage in and provide, again, opportunities for them to have research informed advocacy or action projects in their communities. So while the practicing these commitments requires a lot of different skills, that can seem overwhelming. I think the good news is, is that we don't have to do it alone. At least Katie and I know the benefits of working together. And so we really encourage you to seek out collaborations, not just with young people, but with other people, um, other adults who might have skill sets that you don't have. So if you don't have facilitation skills, you might partner up with other scholars or educators or youth workers in the community that do have those skills. So just want to kind of highlight that, that collaboration is key. And just to kind of wrap up, we want to end with some guiding questions that have really informed our work and that we hope um, will inspire you as well. So how can we intentionally create research collaborations with youth to disrupt white supremacy? How can we shift power in research to empower youth to document and challenge racism? And in what ways does our position as adults, adult allies, and members of a racialized society inform our research with youth? Now, these are just kind of initial questions um, that kind of lead to new questions as you're designing and implementing YPAR projects. So we hope that our commitments and the strategies that we shared today inspire you to think about research in new ways and encourage you to collaborate with young people moving forward. And if you are doing this work, that it's affirming the good work that you're doing already. Thank you so much. We will end here to open up for questions. And just a reminder that the slides do include a full list of the references that were included in our presentation today. Thank you so much. I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Katie and Adriana. That was that was very good, very informative. And um, we have some questions for you. And I'm going to uh, have Ali ask the first question. Sure. Uh, would you say that YPAR is a way of making the concept of research of anti-racist practices more accessible beyond higher academia, or gaining more exposure to it slash generating interest? That's a good question. I think maybe to to Katie's point earlier, it's a um, both and rather than an or. I do think that YPAR helps us, at least for me, I'll speak personally. YPAR helps me enact anti-racist pedagogy and anti-racist research methodology. It gives me a um, process and an approach that really allows me to embody the principles of anti-racism anti research. Katie, what would you say? Yeah, I yeah, I, I would um, I would say that that I think it enables me um, to yeah to really practice um, an anti-racist approach and um, and I but I do think that, you know I think that they work um, hand in hand I think that 
where we see kind of the intersections of these two ideas, um, or these two frameworks, these two kind of sets of critical commitments. Um, and then I think it, it's about, for me personally, it's about continually checking myself against ensuring that um, that these two frameworks and um, are, are really that I'm really holding my commitments to them and being critically self-reflective um, of my own processes. Yeah, and I, I think what I would add right now when you said commitment, and I, we've been talking about this for a while um, together, kind of offline. I think part of why we use the word commitments is that it's not easy to engage in YPAR or anti-racism scholarship because it's not valued, right? I think right now we're in a moment in that people are more willing to see the value of anti-racism practice and research and wanting to learn more about it. Um, but you know, the examples that we gave is work that we've done in the last, you know decade and a half and some of our publications have taken a while to get published because YPAR isn't a dominant way of doing research and, and sometimes we have to justify it as a method not only to um, journal for a review but even in the IRB process at our institutions right we've had to think through like how does um, participation from young people who are also the participants going to be justified and explained to the IRB application when there's very kind of rigid ways of explaining a research design. So I, I do think that there's, in addition to being mindful and reflective, our precisionality in relation to this work, at least for me, I'm constantly juggling the pressure, again, this is white supremacy, the pressure to publish or perish, get as many publications out versus doing the work that means a lot to me, but takes a little bit longer to build relationships, to complete the project, and then it takes time to get it published um, due to different kind of barriers. Um, thank you, that, that was good night. Oops, sorry. Sorry, Stacey, I was just going to say that kind of leads into the other question I have, if you want me to carry on with that yes, one. Yes, go ahead. Um, I, so you brought up the IRB, and someone else has raised the question of, is there any preferred age category to start involving young people? Um, so in this case, the person's wondering whether anti-racism may start at a tender age of three. Yeah, I mean, I think young people are observant we know this through theory that's social learning theory young people are consuming information all the time i think it's us as adults that feel uncomfortable engaging in difficult conversations now we have to be mindful of what's developmentally appropriate katie and i work mostly with i would say mid to late adolescence and then also in our jobs as professors undergraduate students right but I imagine if you are a scholar who's interested in children, that you can also engage them. And there is growing body of literature using YPAR with children as young as like five to nine, right? And so that's not our expertise. So I would say you definitely can if that's something that you're interested, you just have to be mindful. Again, YPAR says center the young people. So what is relevant to a three-year-old? in that context what have they been exposed to and it's also going to be different that you know black children are going to have much more harsher realities than white children and you do have to be mindful of those differences and and what you're interested in engaging children in those conversations it might also be that with younger children you do partnerships with children and parents and again YPAR is intergenerational so there's nothing to say you can't include parents along the way um, and then there was the second question about IRB, I believe. Yes, yeah, so there's a thought, so more about IRB here. Um, so uh, it's more of a technical question. Do you have references about how to talk about how to communicate this work to IRBs? I struggle with my IRB at my institution about what they consider high risk and then treating such work as having youth examine racism as high risk. Mm -hmm. Katie, do you want to share? Um, yeah. I, I wanted to say something on the last um, on the last point, and then I'll just uh, say a word about um, uh, 
some stuff we're doing around IRB. Um, on the on the last um, question around age, so you know, as Adriana said, like I think the majority of our work has been middle school or um, high school age um, young people here in the U.S. Globally, this you know YPAR work has been happening. Um, you know, in the context that we're talking about is has been in the U.S., but this work is happening all around the world. And in many um, communities, some of the earliest writings around YPAR was um, or they didn't call it YPAR, but engaging young people in research and in community development practices and participatory assessments. Um, you know. Um, as young as three, four, five. Um, and so Roger Hart um, um, wrote a great work, um, book in the early 90s around children's geography um, that could be a great resource piece. And then um, there's another great piece called by David Driscoll um, that could also be um, useful. And it was done out of the UNESCO project on growing, I think it was called Growing Up Cities. And they involved young people of multi-age and doing different kinds of research and assessment work, um, all youth led. Um, and, and those books both could be helpful for, um, for the person who asked uh, the question about, about age. Um, in terms of IRB, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely been a challenge. A colleague of uh, mine, um, at the University of Houston, uh, we are working on um, getting something out. Um, we're in the process of, of, of doing this now, but um, we built a, um, we actually built an, an IRB training um, that was um, done for and with young people and have young people helped inform it. And it was for helping the um, her universities um, IRB really understand the process and in, in part because she wanted to involve young people's co-researchers in the way that their grant was um, was written um, she really wanted young people as as co-PIs on the on the uh, co-eyes on the project and so it required um, she was going to have to have young people go through her own university's IRB training which um, wasn't really set up for for young people or for community, and so we worked to develop um, a, a training that her university actually approved. Um, that um, you know was would enable young people to kind of go go through the kind of certifications of sorts that the university needed, but um, but in a way that was um, uh, relevant uh, to them. And of course, you know, as we said so many young people are experts and, and what does it mean to have their information taken from them and to not give, you know, that adults I think are all the time kind of, you know, taking information from young people without consent. So young people really understand these concepts, um, but being able to help um, translate the power and potential of young people's research to IRB is, um, and having IRB understand it was, was partially what we were getting at. So more to come on that, but, um, but we're in the process of trying to write up that project as, as we speak. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I, I'm excited to read that when it comes out. I think the other piece, so there is more published work around YPAR that you can definitely cite if you are submitting to IRB, and that's definitely one approach. Er, very early on, I would say, in our projects, when there still wasn't enough to really justify to IRB or when we were really getting pushback in terms of engaging young people as our um, co-eyes. I think one of the workarounds that we used was because a lot of the YPAR activity was often related to those projects that we talked about earlier, what we, what we would do is just engage in YPAR as part of the programming, the youth programming. And then once we had finish that project, we would go back to IRB and say, we wanna use this program's secondary data. Essentially all of the work that we had done, um, all of the documentation that the young people had gathered. Uh, and that was one kind of strategy that we used early on, I would say in our careers. I think at this point, there is definitely more out there to help justify the process. And to Katie's point, you can also, if you have the capacity, to then also train your IRB officers around this methodology. Because it won't just be beneficial to you, but it will also be beneficial to the institution and other people who are trying to do this work. I think um, just my other last little thing on this, um, there's also a paper that I worked on that's I think in in print um, or it's 
kind of in the final um, stages before it comes out in print that is kind of looking at the multiple different ethical issues, both in terms of understanding the process and also pushing back to think about how do we change the system? Because of course, that's also part of kind of bringing, you know, bringing an anti-racist lens is pushing back around the system itself. And can we, can we push the system to think differently about who can be producers of knowledge? What does it mean to involve young people um, as um, in the production of knowledge and, and young people as experts and kind of challenging some of these notions about um, how IRB t tends to classify young people um, and in the um, within the within the system, and so there's a lot. I think there are a number of people who are trying to kind of grapple with these questions um, right now. Thank you. I, I wanted to ask one more question, but before I do, I just wanted to um, uh, just show some of the upcoming uh, webinars. Uh, so we have our Quality of Research and Innovation series. Uh, a few more webinars. Please feel free to register for those. Also. Uh, we have four more webinars on our culturally responsive research series, um, so it's easy to, to find those and register for them. Um, and I also just wanted to uh, say I'd you know, love for people to join the community. We, we do a lot of work to help people like these types of webinars to share uh, what what researchers are doing so, you, doing so you can learn from each other. Uh, and so feel free to join. You'll get a little survey at the end that asks if you'd like to become a member and I'll send you some information. Uh, but for the last question, I just wanted to, um, th to read this one. It says, thank you for this talk. It was really helpful. Uh, the question is, I'm currently writing the methodology section of my dissertation proposal, incorporating um, participatory approach to qualitative research with youth. I'm wondering, what does a research question look like for a participatory perspective? I know that ideally, the RQs would come from participants, but how do I frame my inquiry before I meet my participants? That's an excellent question, and one that I think we probably grapple with every single time we're starting a new project, especially if we're, I, I know for me that's the difficult question in seeking out funding, because you're, especially if you're doing a research grant, people wanna know what's your research question, and often the pushback when I've said that is gonna come up organically through the process, it hasn't been effective. So you do have to have some kind of research question. So I would say for me, it's often, I'm really interested in what are the contexts and the processes that empower young people to do the work and what are some of the outcomes, especially those ripple effect outcomes that Katie was talking about, like what are the outcomes to the community? What are the outcomes of like collective agency? So depending on what, you are interested in if you're an educational researcher that might mean what are the pedagogical strategies used to engage young people in xyz or if you are a developmental psychologist you might be interested in you know what are the developmental um, cognitive capacities or emotional effective responses to using YPAR methods so i think you have you can have your own kind of research agenda or research line of inquiry that has nothing to do with what the young people themselves are going to um, investigate or want to um, focus on. Katie, what would you say? Yeah, yeah, I would say something similar, like what it, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a visual person. So sometimes I think about it like is it, what's your what's the overarching umbrella, right? So that you could you could kind of think about a lot of projects being kind of housed with housed underneath it. But what's what are some of the overarching kind of big questions um, that you're interested in driving forward um, to which young people's voices and experience and ideas could help drive specific understanding or nuances of that? Um, and so that's one way I've kind of thought about my work or kind of what are the what are the overarching topics or overarching um, kind of big questions um, that that these kind of individual projects that are of course going to nuance and and develop their own questions but it can be housed underneath that so mm -hmm. if that's a, a helpful framework great um, thank you so much uh, to both of you I have a lot of great questions people really appreciated learning um, from both of you so I want to say thank you and also thanks to um, Ali too Yes, thank you everyone. I really appreciated this. It's Friday evening in London and this was such a great way to end my week. <laughs> so thank you for that inspiring talk. It was brilliant. Thank, thank you, you so much for having us. Thank you for having us. Take care. Thank you. Have a great weekend, thank everyone. Yes. Bye, everyone. Bye.